family to come in here. We've each been put here by God. So I'm so thankful to see everybody's face. Um, I don't know how many of you may be feeling tired, but I know that I have been feeling tired. And scripture offers such sweet encouragement for us, especially when we feel troubled and when we feel burdened or weighed down. So starting in, in John chapter 14, I'm going to just share some encouragement from Jesus to each one of us, starting in verse 1. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If not, I would have told you. I am going away to prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I'm going. Lord, Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will also know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So even though we may feel tired or, or run down or beat up by the world, we can know that this is not the only place that there is. There is hope on the other side of eternity. God is making a home for us, a very real home that will last forever, that no one can take away. And as we think about that living hope, I just pray that your heart would be lifted up to the Father as we sing this morning. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing.
this morning I was just thanking you that you are creator. Lord, you created the heavens and the earth, but you created us also, Lord. And I thank you and I praise you that you are a God who does not just create and walk away. But I thank you that your word also says, Lord, that you create and you sustain. You hold us together by the word, the power of your holy word, Lord. I thank you. I thank you that we can count on your faithfulness. Lord, the sun has been rising and setting and rising and setting for ages. And even above that, we can trust in your faithfulness. Even above knowing that there will be day and night and seasons, God, we can still know, no matter what our circumstances, that you are faithful and that your promises will stand and that you have gathered and you are calling even now people to gather to yourself in love just simply because you love us God I thank you that we will be with you one day I thank you that we have a living hope I just pray God for every person in this room in this building, God, upstairs and downstairs. I pray that you would show yourself so clearly, God, this morning, that we couldn't help but fall on our face in worship before you. That we couldn't help but to surrender ourselves to you. I just pray for salvation to touch this place, God. I thank you for the people that you have already saved. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for wrapping us in your grace. Just help us, Lord, to be more thankful. We love you and we need you, God. Bless the preaching of your word. Teach us, God. Show us more of you. And help us by the power of your Holy Spirit to be obedient to your call. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Oh, man, y'all. I woke up my eyes in the wrong church. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, if you're a guest with us this morning, my name is Byron. I have the opportunity to give leadership as a pastor here at Identity, and I get excited um, every Sunday morning that I wake up uh, because I know that I get an opportunity to be with family, and uh, this is a a joyous thing for me. Um, some of us are not people, people. Like some of us are introverts and, and we're okay if it's just us and God. That's not me. Uh, I need to be around the people of God because I know the presence of God is around the people of God. So thank you so much for being with us this morning. Uh, we do want to invite you. This is an invitation. If you have not uh, gotten connected with us, if you have not filled out a connect card, those are our blue cards. They should be on your row. Um, if you fill one of those out and you submit it, you might get a, a, a million dollar check in the mail. I don't know. You know, whatever God does. But no, in, in all seriousness, there's a lot of moving parts with identity. And we are a church plant and we have some schedules that are a little bit different for most people. So we try to stay connected with people so that we can try to communicate well what we're doing, what we're not doing, when we're doing it. Um, so if you like, you can fill that out. Of course, it's not an obligation, but it is an invitation. Uh, also, let me go ahead and mention uh, here at Identity, we don't pass a plate, but we do encourage all those who follow Jesus that they would engage in the act or the discipline or the rhythm of giving just because our Lord is a generous Lord. He is a good God and he cares for his church and he cares for his people. 
and uh, our giving is an outpouring of our discipleship. So uh, if you would like to give, there are a few different ways you can give here at Identity. Uh, the best way is through our website, identitydaytona.org slash give, or if you already have our app, you can go on the app and give in that way. Or you can do as this gentleman is doing right now. He's walking to the front. He's going to drop it in that envelope or in that basket right there. Drop that gift there. And if you have a gift like that, um, I, I think his is like a million dollars in there. So, uh, you know, if you have, if you want to match his gift, hallelujah, you can drop it right there in that basket. All right. Two jokes already. Thank you, Lord. Um, this is the time where we move into the word of God. And uh, sitting under the word of God is an act of worship. Right? So it's not, it's not Byron worshiping God in the preaching of the word alone. It's the hearing of the word that transforms us as well. So this is an act of worship for each and every one of us. This is a powerful moment. So uh, we are in the sermon series. It's called, This is My Church. Everybody say it with me. This is my church. Yes. And I would love for you all to be able to proclaim that. Uh, to the people who ask questions about identity. What kind of church is identity? What do they believe? How do they worship? Who are they as a people? We've talked through all of those things in the last month and a half, uh, actually close to two, closer to two months. And uh, I've just had such a good time walking through our mission, our vision, our values, our beliefs. And this morning, we'll wrap up that series with a value that is incredibly important to me. And I pray that it'll be incredibly important to you as well. Uh, this is the type of sermon that I get really excited to preach, but I also fear how you all will take it. And I'm not talking much about sin and all of that stuff. You don't have to get all, you know, cringed up or all of that. But, but I am talking about something that I think is integral to a walk of a Christian. It's making disciples. I, I don't normally wear hoodies in the pulpit, but... I wanted to make sure y'all saw this. <laughs> I wanted to set the tone. So if, if you could, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 28. You already know the verses. Matthew chapter 28. We'll actually be reading verses 16 through 20. And while you're turning there, let me tell you a little bit more about myself. Many of y'all know this, but some of the guests might not know this. I'm from a place called Fayetteville, North Carolina. And Fayetteville, North Carolina, um, it's an interesting place because depending on what part you go in, you might believe that Fayetteville is just like a really uh, smaller city or mid-sized city. And Fayetteville has grown up tremendously. We have all, the, we got a Dave and Buster's now. I, I, it blew my mind uh, how much Fayetteville has grown up into a city. Uh, also, Fayetteville is connected to a military base, Fort Bragg. Uh, so many people who go through Fayetteville, they know of Fort Bragg, so they think of Fayetteville in that way. But if you are really from Fayetteville, you know that we aren't just city boys in Fayetteville. It's some country boys in Fayetteville. And, and that's actually where my people come from. We, we, see, we don't even call it Fayetteville. We call it down the road. And down the road means that you're in the country part of Fayetteville. If I were to take you to Deep Creek Road, where my, my dad and my granddad and his father grew up, you would see this rural environment. It's farms and all of that stuff. So when I talk to my kids about Fayetteville, I'm like, see, y'all don't know. I had, we had horses and we had cattle and we had goats and chickens and we had ducks and we had all of these things right here in Fayetteville. But if you've grown up in a rural environment, whether it's you or your grandma or, or whoever it is, you know that in these rural environments, on these farms, there's one animal that is likely more valuable than any other animal. It's this one. We'll put it on the screen right now. Do you know what this animal is? It looks like a donkey. It's a mule. This is a mule. Now, if you're not country, you're from the city, you're like, I, they all look the same. <laughs> a, mule, a mule is like a donkey. A mule is like a horse. Actually, a mule is a hybrid animal, right? It's like a labradoodle where you take two different species and you crossbreed them and it makes a mule. So, so a mule is, is like a female horse bred with a male donkey and the crossbreed of the two make a mule. Now, if, if you were into agriculture or if you were a farmer, you would know how valuable this animal is. That you will pay a, a few dollars for some chickens or, or a little a bit for some goats. You might pay a couple hundred for some horses, but you know what you'll pay for a mule? Thousands. This is the most valuable animal on most farms. 
And until we got tractors and all of these things that could plow the land, this is where your money went. This is the money animal. You know why? Because a mule will outlive a horse by almost 25 years. A mule takes less upkeep than any other animal on the farm. But even more than that, the mule gets more done every single day than any other animal. That's why when, when they would be trying to tread out the land so that they could plant the seed, right? They didn't use a horse. They didn't use a cow. They used a mule because the mule got the job done. The mule did not complain. The mule made it so the seed could be planted. It could grow up. It could go into something beautiful and fruitful. See, when we think about the church, most often, when we think about people coming to know Jesus, when we think about the growth of a church or the growth of the kingdom of God, we think that it happens with people who are like mules. They will dedicate all of their life to preaching the gospel, engaging in evangelism, going to the nations to be missional. We like the mules. Billy Graham, he's like a mule. He spends all of his life. He pours everything he has out to the people of America. That's mule ministry. You might know somebody in the church you grew up in or, or in the school that you went to that no matter what was going on in life, they had no problem sharing the gospel with the people who were around them. And they'll probably do that for the rest of their life. But guess what? Guess what happens when a mule passes away? The ministry is over. The work is done. See, horses have 46 or 40, uh, 44 chromosomes. See, donkeys have 42 chromosomes. So that means a mule has 43 chromosomes, which you might not be good at biology. I am not either. But guess what? That means the mule is infertile. It cannot reproduce. So although the mule is fruitful all of its life, once the mule dies, his work is over. But that's not what God has called us to. Actually, God God never set out for this to be mule ministry. It's not like Jesus comes down for 33 years and does everything for us, and then we just enjoy the fruit of what he's done. When Jesus speaks of the kingdom of God being made real on heaven and earth, he talks about ministry that is a multiplication ministry. That once you die, once we die, things don't stop keep going. He would spend his last moments with his disciples, pressing that truth to us. Matthew chapter 28, we'll start in verse 16. You know, most people say start in verse 18, but we need the context. See, Jesus, before he had died, had already told his disciples, yo, I got to leave. I'm taking a little leave of absence, but I will be back. And when I come back, this is where you should meet me in Galilee, not in Jerusalem, in Galilee. Look at verse 16. It says this. The 11 disciples traveled to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped. But some doubted. Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me. Let me repeat that. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Pray with me. God, you've given us a great command of love that we might love you and love our neighbor. You've given us a great communion, which means relationship with you, knowing that you are with us. We are one with you. But you've also given us a great 
commandment and a commission to go with that commandment. So God, I, I pray right now in this preaching moment that we wouldn't just focus on the command and focus on the, the communion and leave apart the commission that you are on mission at this very moment. You always have been, and you have included us in this mission because we are one with your son, Jesus. So God, massage our hearts right now. Let the word of God be the most important thing. And let us grab hold to the truth that you are with us as we go out on mission for you. We pray all these things and many more in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, and amen. Before we read the text, I, I told you about a mule. But now I want to talk about a goat. <laughs> oh, uh, I don't know if y'all are basketball fans at all. I'm just going to take a couple minutes to enjoy this. Uh, the greatest of all time, the best basketball player to ever play the game is Michael Jeffrey Jordan, born in Brooklyn, New York, settling in Wilmington, North Carolina, not too far from Fayetteville, North Carolina, where I grew up. <laughs> See, Michael Jeffrey Jordan would spend his college years at University of North Carolina, where he would win not one, but two NCAA basketball championships. Then he would be drafted to the Chicago Bulls. Michael Jeffrey Jordan would be the, one of the greatest basketball players of all time. He would get scoring titles, defensive titles, all types of awards. But you know what? You know what the best thing that happened was? He went to the NBA championship, not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, six times. That's why he has the number six up there, just in case y'all didn't know. And did he, not only did he go six times, he won six times. So y'all king? I ain't, look, I, okay, let me stay on the goat. Let me stay on the goat. He went six times, and he won six times. You've heard the stories. Larry Bird, older, winning championships. He would see Michael Jordan and say, this is the greatest basketball player I've ever seen. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, more championships, longer career, and he would say, this is the greatest basketball player I've ever seen. But not just the older people, the younger people, the people who came after him. See, I grew up, I grew up in the 90s, which means I got to see a few of these championships. I got to see Michael Jordan gliding in the air. I got to see a lot of those things. Some of y'all young, y'all just look at the highlights. I saw it. <laughs> but here's what I love most about Michael Jordan. What I love most about Michael Jordan, and the reason why I will always call him the GOAT, is because I watched a generation of players after him try to be just like him. See, y'all don't remember those days with Tracy McGrady, and as he's pulling up a, a mid-shot going towards the rim about 10 feet away, trying to emulate Michael Jordan. Y'all don't remember Vince Carter. You remember Vince Carter. You know Vince. Y'all don't remember Vince Carter gliding through the air and also having to go to University of North Carolina so he could be like Mike. And then, and then there's this guy named Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant is one of the greatest players to ever play the game. He's not the GOAT, but I believe he's the closest to the GOAT that we've ever seen. If you go to the Connect right now, you'll see a picture that looks just like this on the wall of the Connect. And the reason why we have that picture in the Connect is because of this moment here. See, this moment here, Kobe Bryant is in his second year in the NBA. He's playing an all-star basketball game with the greatest of all time, Michael Jordan. There was about a four-minute stretch where Mike would go down and he'd score a point, and then Kobe would go down the other way and he'd score a point, and, and they would go back and forth, and all of a sudden Kobe would try to play some defense on Mike to keep him from making a shot. Michael Jordan, unfazed. Dribble, dribble, fake, turn, hits the shot. As they ran back down the court, though, a beautiful moment happened. Kobe Bryant, as he would lean over, he wouldn't talk junk to Michael Jordan. He didn't spend that moment gloating in how many points he had scored. He asked Michael Jordan, how did you do that? See, Kobe had already spent so much of his career, even though it had been short, emulating Mike. But at this moment, he was pursuing the secrets of Michael Jordan. 
And Michael Jordan, instead of trying to hoard it to himself, uh, one of the most competitive players to ever play the game, he shares his secrets. In the midst of about 20 seconds, what does Kobe do? He immediately goes down to court and attempts the same shot. See, Mike is great to me because of that moment. When Kobe Bryant died, Michael Jordan had spoke at his funeral full of tears. And he spoke of the many secret moments that he and Kobe had conversations. And the many conversations he had about not just his technique or his way of releasing a shot, but the way he lived his life. See, Michael Jordan, he left an imprint on Kobe. So even when Kobe died, that imprint lived on. Y'all heard of Mamba mentality. After Kobe died, we see men like Devin Booker, and Jason Tatum, <laughs> Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, all talking about how in Kobe's last couple of years, he put his arms around them and wanted to teach them the same things that Mike had taught them. See, this this, yes, is an opportunity for me to have fun talking about basketball, but what it's even more is an illustration. It's an illustration of the way that God wants us to make our imprint on the generations that come after us. We don't need to have mule ministries. And even though this is the goat's way, I would say that beyond the mule and the goat is the shepherd who has his sheep and his sheep know his voice. They hear his voice and they know his voice and the sheep look to their shepherd and they want to do things that please their shepherd and disciple making is a part of us being good sheep. See, Jesus wants us to have a ministry of multiplication so that when it's our time to go to glory, that there are other people who said, no, this person spit seconds or, or minutes or years pouring into me so that I might have what they had. Our mission here at Identity, we said it a few weeks ago, our mission is to establish a diverse sending base in Midtown Daytona out to the world. But how do we create that base without making disciples? We don't. That there's absolutely no way for us to be missional without each and every one of us taking on the cause of making disciples. And I say each and every one of us because, again, many of us would say, no, I want to invest in a mule ministry. Let's let Byron make disciples. Like, let's let Byron preach the word and we'll just invite people to church and then maybe they'll come to Jesus after hearing him preach the word. But guess what really happens in life? Churches don't grow just off of their leader. Churches grow because there are people in those churches that want to see each and every person look more and more like Jesus that walks in the door. That's what disciple making does. Before we get too deep in the weeds, let me give you six identities of a disciple. We talked about this when we were in our core team development phase. There are six core identities that we believe in that a disciple has. The first one is a lover. What does Jesus say is the greatest command? Love God love your neighbor. You cannot be a disciple of Jesus without being a lover. You have to love God, love the people around you, love your community. And in an interesting way, you must love the world without opting into being like the world. See, I love John 3:16. For God so loved the world. Not the church, not not just his people, not the kingdom that's being built. He loved the world. His motive to reach out to you is because his love for the world. A disciple is a lover. A disciple is also a follower. That's literally what it means to follow, to become a student or an apprentice of. If you are not following Jesus, you cannot say that you're a disciple. And what does followership look like? It, it looks like you walking in the things that Jesus has done. It looks like you pursuing the things that Jesus did, living a life that's like Jesus. You must also be a servant, the son of man. The son of man came not to be served, but to serve. And we are to be like him, being servants. A disciple is a worshiper. I know a lot of people uh, would, would, would kind of like hesitate on this and they would say, no, 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 all I got to do is, is know Jesus and read my Bible and all of that. I don't really got to worship. No, but a disciple is a worshiper. 
I, I told you all this before. I remember talking to a young lady, and she was saying, you know what? There's no evidence in the Bible that Jesus ever went to church. I said, oh, man, this is easy. This is easy. I said, turn to Mark chapter 2 when it, when it says, he went into the synagogue as it was his custom. Jesus was a regular worshiper, not just in uh, the, the, the temple or the place to worship, but, but also outside of that. But don't neglect one for the other. You must worship every day of your life, whether you're here or whether you're out there. A disciple is a worshiper. A disciple is also a family member. See, all of us are brought into this body of Christ to be brothers and sisters. You must be a family member and love the family well to be a disciple. But the last part, the last one that I think we have a little bit of trouble with is a disciple must be a multiplier. A disciple has to be a person who's making disciples. Actually, you cannot truly be a disciple of Jesus without making disciples. It goes against what it means to be a disciple. See, some people use the word discipleship. Discipleship means your following of Jesus. But see, in discipleship must be disciple making. Because as you are looking to be like Jesus, and Jesus is making disciples, then you must make disciples as you're looking to be like Jesus. A disciple must be a disciple maker. And it's clear, Matthew 28, 19, what does it say? Go, therefore, make disciples. Now, I want to do something. Uh, um, our Bible study feet, people, y'all already got some of this, but I, I just want to break some stuff down to y'all. If we had the Greek in front of us right now, there's only one imperative in this actual verse. Is it, is it go? No. Is it baptizing? No. If we went down to verse 20, is it teaching? No. And, and see, that's interesting because the church has focused its efforts mainly in those three. How many people are coming to faith that we can baptize and teach? We're going to have a discipleship class so that we can teach. Oh, you, you need to train other people so you have to learn how to teach. But there's only one imperative in this entire verse, and it is make disciples. All of the rest are participles. All of the rest, if you were like, I didn't, I didn't pass ELA, uh, this is what that means. The most important thing in that verse is make disciples. Going and baptizing and teaching are ways that we make disciples. But the most important thing is not go, it's not baptize. It's not even teaching. It's Jesus saying very clearly with so much seriousness, you must make disciples. Because if Jesus left it at the 12 and he didn't push them to go and share with anyone else, then after Jesus died, and after Peter and James and Bartholomew and all of the rest had died, Christianity would have died as well. But it's because faithful brothers and sisters decided to make disciples that we know of Jesus in this very day. Here's something simple. Jesus commands his disciples to make disciples. Jesus commands his disciples to make disciples because it's the fruit of the discipleship to Jesus. The fruit of the discipleship to Jesus is being obedient. And in that obedience, you're obedient to the command of making disciples. See, discipleship in that day, discipleship was a 24-7 thing. This is, there was no breaks. You didn't take a time off, or it wasn't like an internship where you get the summers and your weekends off. Like, if you said, no, I want to follow a rabbi, you gave your entire life to following the rabbi. And see, what was interesting was, as you gave your life over to the rabbi, you're, you're essentially saying, I want to be just like my teacher. See, in America, we say, no, I want to be unique. I want to be different. I don't want to look just like him. I don't want to preach just like her. I, I don't want to look just like this church. But see, in Jesus' day, it was beautiful when you looked like your teacher. That someone could see you, hear your voice, even see the way you're walking and say, oh, he must be a disciple of this person. 
It was so much so uh, that if you were a rabbi and you had a bad hip and you were walking like this most of the day, uh, grown men who were healthy <laughs> would start walking like this because of their rabbi. They wanted to look just like the rabbi. This is what discipleship looked like. And this is what Jesus was inviting the 12 into. He said, hey, I want you all to look just like me. See, but in our day, in our day, we, we tend to believe that making disciples is optional. That many of us would go all of our lives without truly sharing our lives and multiplying ourselves. That we would say, no, 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 church attendance is enough. Yeah, I went to Bible study. I'm a part of this group. People know my sin nature, but, but no, no, no. I'm not going to intentionally go and do the thing that Jesus asked me to do. Now, can you be a believer? Can, can you be in the kingdom of God without making disciples? Yes, you can. But how good of a disciple are you if you're not obedient to your teacher? I love my children. I love them to death. They're my children. I love them no matter what. But our relationship is different when they're actually obedient to the things that, that my, my wife and I ask them to do. Obedience is an act of love. It's saying I love God so much that I actually trust him in calling me to do this particular thing. Disciple making. Disciple making is not optional. But I know, I know it's hard. It is hard. Many of us would say, um, I don't really know enough to make disciples. Like, I, I, if I could just learn more or maybe get a college course or like maybe if I could take a class on evangelism, then maybe I can become a disciple maker. Some of us don't think we have enough. That when we go home or when we're riding in our car, we are insecure about what God has actually done in our lives. So how can we make disciples of other people? So, some of us just don't think that disciple making is for everyone. But I think God is faithful in showing us in the text through many ways that disciple making is for every single person in the church. So, so this is what I would like for us to do for the next three hours. I want to answer these questions. Why we make disciples? When and where we should make disciples? and how we should make disciples. Why, when and where, and how. The first one is answering the why question. And it's pretty simple. We make disciples out of our obedience to our Lord. That's why we make disciples. I would love to sit here in front of you to inspire you and make you feel good and say, hey, if you make disciples, like, you're, you're gonna, like, your life is going to be blessed and, you know, everything's going to take off for you and you, you make disciples and God is going to overflow in abundance of blessing. For I, w- I wish I could give you that. But I actually, I want you to ask the question, is obedience to Christ's lordship not enough? See, if we truly proclaim that Jesus is Lord, then we're saying what he says is what we will do. That if anybody has authority over our lives, it's him. So just him saying it should be enough. Look at Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, and look at how many things speak to his lordship. The 11 disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. They're listening. They're looking to be obedient to their teacher. But then what does he say? All authority has been given over to me. And there's no thing, there's no thing that keeps me from being Lord of your life. See, here's the fact. Jesus is Lord whether you obey him or not. But if you're a true lover of God, why would you disobey? I can imagine that there could be a disciple on the side. Maybe it's Thomas. Y'all know I'd be picking on Thomas. He's like, yo, Jesus said, do what? <laughs> and then Jesus said, whoa, 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 hold on now. I got all authority. So don't, don't push this on the Father. The Father gave me the authority. I know y'all just learned about the Spirit, but no, 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 the Spirit's with me in this. See, Jesus says there is no greater authority out there. So as I tell you to do what I'm telling you to do, it's for good reason, because I am not just Lord, I'm Savior. I died for you. 
He's saying all authority, all authority. And then he says, as you are making disciples, teach them to observe everything I've commanded. This is a call for obedience. It's a call for obedience. He's saying, as you're being obedient to me, I'm asking that you teach how to be obedient. Authority is enough. Obedience to our rabbi should be enough. Because as we are obedient to our rabbi, we are actually doing what he called us to do, to abide in him. See, this idea of abiding is not just holding go or holding tight as the world tries to pull you apart. This idea of abiding is saying, I am here no matter what. That I am actively engaging in my love for God. I am here. I am abiding. And that is why I am obedient. We have to make disciples because we are being obedient to our Lord. But we also make disciples every place that we go. That's the when and the where. Every place we go. Put Matthew 19 back on, uh, Matthew 28, 19 back on the screen. Again, I told you the only imperative in this verse is make disciples. But guess what that first word points us to? See, many people for hundreds of years have read that word go, and they've said to themselves, oh, I got to pick up and go. God, I, I love talking to like church planners and, and, and uh, ministry, ministers and leaders because they say, well, God called me to such and such. It's like, oh, that's, that's dope. Like, God called you to such and such. I, I remember that was me at one time. I remember going to this conference, and I, I looked at this church planter, and he was old, much older than me, and I said, I think God is calling me to Atlanta. He said, well, really? I said, yeah. He said, when's the last time you've been to Atlanta? I said, oh, it's been a couple years. But I did the demographic study. Like, I did the research. I know how many unsaved people are there. God is calling me to Atlanta. He said, really? How many disciples have you made in Daytona? I mean, Daytona ain't really like the spiritual place to do that. No. No, see that word go? It's not Jesus saying pack your bags and get ready to listen to the voice of the Spirit that's going to send you across the world. That word go actually is better translated as you are going. It's an aorist participle, which, which means like it's a process word. Uh, that it's as you are going, as your life is in process, make disciples. It's as if Jesus is saying like, wait, hold on. I already know everything about y'all's lives. I already know y'all going to do a lot of stuff. So as you are doing all of these things, go make disciples. And that, that, should, be, that should take some weight off of us. It should because we don't have to think about being in mission trips and going across the world, even though that's a beautiful thing. It means as you are going to 7-Eleven, as you are going to class, as you are being with this group of people who you like to hang out with, as you are going to church, all of those are opportunities to obey Christ in making disciples. We live an as-you-are-going life. So your location, your season, the time, all of that, all of that just pours into the as you are going, which means there's never a time. There's never a season. There's never a location where you cannot make disciples. He's calling us to this. And you know what this looks like? Let me, let me give us an illustration of what that looks like for a church. Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19 is so, so interesting because Paul is on his third missionary journey, and, and he's going to this place called Ephesus. Now, we've read the book of Ephesus. Like, if you've ever read it, it's different, and it's different in, in a lot of ways. But one peculiar difference between Ephesus is when Paul talks to the people of Corinth, he's like, y'all ratchet, y'all, y'all messed up, like, y'all need the gospel. When he writes to the people in Galatia, he's saying, hey, y'all ain't really got the gospel right. Uh, y'all are some false teachers, but we love you anyway. Here's the gospel. But in Ephesus, in the book of Ephesians, there's this positive tone. It's almost like Paul loves what's happening in Ephesus. And then if you turn to Revelation, you see that there are churches in Ephesus that are actually good churches. And I think that's because of what happened in Acts chapter 19. 
See, Acts chapter 19, there's healing going on. There's people giving up of their idols. And then we see in verses 8 through 10 this. Read it with me. Uh, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly over a period of three months. That means Paul went to the church. He, he would have popped up in here and shared the gospel. And we would have been like, I don't know, Paul. I ain't really trying to die. Like, you know, like, is that a, is that a metaphor? Like, you really just want me to, like, let go of my brownie habit, right? No, he's like, no, no, you got to die. So he did this for three months. And I sat down and read this and thought about my, my life. And I'm like, how many things have I committed myself for three months? Like, how many, how many times have I said, for the next three months, I'm going to pray about this, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, which changed my life? for three months. But get this, he don't stop in three months. He he spoke boldly about the kingdom of God. He was arguing, trying to persuade them about this kingdom. So church folks don't want the kingdom of God, which is wild. But then look at verse nine. But when some became hardened and would not believe and started slandering the way in front of the crowd, he withdrew from them, but he took his disciples. Now, we talked about this in Bible study as well. See, before uh, there were a group of disciples, they were John's disciples, so they knew what repentance was, but they did not truly know who Jesus was. So Paul, he gave his life over to these people, bringing them to the truth of the gospel. And then what did he do? Baptize them. And then he taught them to be obedient to the way. So Paul says, I'm going to take these few people who are obedient to following Jesus, and I'm going to do this. Look at verse Look at the continuation of this verse. He said, it withdrew, taking his disciples and conducted discussions every day at a lecture hall of Tyrannius. This went on for two years. Two years. So that all the residents of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. This is one of the most powerful revivals that we see in Scripture, and we skip over it. Oftentimes, we, we're thinking about the Spirit overflowing and, and 3,000 people being added in one day and, and the Lord adding to their number each and every day. And yet, Paul, he would give of his life, sharing of the gospel, discipling men and women. And what does it say? After two years, everyone in Asia Minor had heard the gospel. Have you even thought of that reality? Have you even thought about the fact that you could spend a certain amount of time giving yourself over to what the Lord has commanded you to do and that people actually might get saved? Like, think of that reality. Think of if each and every one of us took that on. Think about if we took that on as a church. Like, like think if we literally said in Daytona over the next two years, we want to make sure that everybody here has at least heard the gospel. They might not have responded to it. They might not have had an altar call and walked up to the front. They might not take communion or join anybody's church. But, but what if we got radical enough to believe the scriptures and say, no, we're going to take the next two years and make disciples and share the gospel so that everybody could say, yo, yo, Jesus is real. And although I might not believe him, there's a group of people who believe him. And we've heard this message over and over and over. This could happen. This could happen right here. See, see, in Daytona Beach right now, as the last census has taken place, there are about 71,000 residents in Daytona Beach. Statistics would say 21% identify as Christian, which, which means Christ follower believers of Jesus. 21%. I'm horrible at math, but let me just say this. I got it written down in my notes. This means that there are 56,000 people who would say that they don't have a relationship with the living God. 56,000. That's not enough for you. If that's not enough for you, our county, Volusia County, has just over half a million people, 580,000 people. Only 21% would identify themselves as Christian, true followers of Jesus, which means 460,000 people would say that they do not know Jesus. That, that hurts me. Like when I think about the, the reasons why I don't share the gospel or don't make disciples, 
I need to think about that. That there are 460,000 people. That there are 58,000, excuse me, there are 56,000 people right here in our backyard that don't know the truth about Jesus Christ. But, but if we were to just do the math, we know that this is crazy. <laughs> right? Like, you say, like, okay, if, if, if one new person came to our church every week, then, then we could get 365 people, or, or no, what, 52 people every week or a year, and, and then we just keep doing that. So if we just see one new visitor, you know, every week, we convince them to stay, we teach them the gospel, then we say we're going to build them up as a person, then we could get 52 people. And 52 people, that's beautiful, but that's not what Scripture shows. Scripture doesn't speak of a ministry of addition. It speaks of a ministry of multiplication. So look at this right here. If we were to add a person every time, this is what it would look like. So every, this is us adding a person every day. Are we going to add someone every day? We won't. But this is kind of what it would look like. But if each and every one of us multiplied ourselves, it could look something like that. It's like that question that they have on social media. Can I give you a million dollars today or can I give you one cent and double it each and every day? And people are like, give me the million dollars. Like, but it's five million if you just let it multiply. This is what we say about the church all the time. It's like, nah, nah, we're good with our visitor. You know, and then the visitor don't even stay with like two months. And none of us have made disciples. We just enjoy the community that we have. And yet Jesus, he wants us to get into this multiplication ministry. So as you are going, when you go to that gym, when you go to the classroom, when you hang out with the people that you do the things you like with, as you go to the restaurant, as you stop at the same gas station every single day, be in the mindset that you can be making disciples there. If you don't believe it, Philip was just walking down the street and saw an Ethiopian dude and was like, yo, I see you reading the scriptures. Do you really know Jesus? He's like, oh. Kind of. And Philip's like, oh, no, we got to fix this. This one, Here we go. <clears throat> and, and you know what I think? I think we are just in this mode where we say, like, no, we, we let people make the decision on their own. You know, whenever somebody decides to get baptized, then they'll get baptized. But yet in the scriptures, they kind of took it differently. They said, oh, if you're going to profess faith, then baptism is a sign of your profession of faith. And now I'm going to spend my life with you so that you can learn how to be obedient to Jesus. We're like, oh, no, nah, you know, they, they're busy on Thursdays. And I know they got class. And, you know, they, this is what they want to do in their career. So, you know, I'm just not going to do anything about it and blah, blah, blah. And I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to myself. That we will find every reason not to make disciples. And I would just pray that we find reasons to make disciples. The last thing I want to I share with you all is we make disciples from our abiding in Jesus. So often people ask me the question, well, how do I make a disciple? Where do I teach them? Where do I take them? What, am I point, what do I point them to? And what I want each and every one of us to grab hold to is we make disciples out of our abiding in Jesus. As Jesus is loving on us and we're connected to him, there are things that you're growing in every single day. I mean, Deja and I have had conversations this week. Ty and I have had conversations. D, uh, uh, Kimyata, so many of us. Nikki, we've had conversations about little things that the Lord has done just in this week. Who are you sharing that with? Who are we sharing that with? That's what disciple making is. It's just you simply saying that we make disciples. I'm going to make disciples just out of the overflow of my relationship with Jesus. Look at, look at 19 and 20 again. Let me show you this in the text. It says, uh, go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded. Here is an important thing to remember. And remember, I am with you. See, when we think of discipleship, when we think of leading people to be like Jesus, we think it's up to us. Disciple making happens because Jesus is in your life. It happens because you are connected to the source. And all you are teaching, which is really just reminding people, is how to obey Jesus. That's it. That's it. See, see we, we, we think that teaching is too hard for us. But let me show you some moments that happen 
Every fourth Sunday, we get together. We walk around this neighborhood. We try to bless the neighborhood. And during that time, there has not been one time in the last uh, six months or so that I don't see a couple of people having conversations about their faith. That's a part of your teaching. That's a part of you showing people how to obey. Each and every week on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, we do a Bible study. And Ty and them were joking about us, uh, like, canceling the Bible study because we have such small numbers. But guess what happens at that Bible study? Each and every time, we are sharing our lives with one another. and We're growing to be more observant to the things that the Lord has taught. See, we, we like whenever we do the benediction and then we hit the road, Jack. But that reflection and response time, That reflection and response time is built into our worship time so that we might grow to obey the things of Jesus even more. It's not like we don't have enough time, y'all. We give way more time to Instagram and eating food. We can make disciples. We have the time. And we have God behind us showing us how to do this. Soon we're going to have our small groups or what we call circles. That's disciple making. But it's not there. Let me warn y'all. We're not crafting these circles so that we can all get together, have fun, and share about our temptations. No, the goal of those circles should be that in that time, disciples are being made. See, teaching, teaching is about obedience. It's it's, it's 2 Timothy 2.2, where where Timothy says, or Paul writes to Timothy, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men. This is Paul. He's saying this. Paul is not by himself, but Paul has the relationship with Timothy, and it's Timothy and the many witnesses. So as Paul passes it to Timothy and the many witnesses, he has faith that Timothy and the witnesses are going to pass it on to faithful people who are going to pass it on to faithful people, and this is how the kingdom of God is built. Intentionally trusting Jesus and passing on the things that you know. Now, now let me let me take it another step. Because some of you, you can amen this and then we'll get out of here. It's going to be hard. I remember a few years ago, uh, Kim Yada and I led FCA at Bethune-Cookman, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And it was something I did not want to do. She wanted to do. And when we got our group, our group was comprised of about five female volleyball players. So automatically, I'm like, I'm out. I'm good. But Kim Yada, uh, she would say to me, Yo, can you just teach me all of these things? Can can we do an intensive on all of these things? And I remembered something that my discipler told me. No, all you got to do is stay one step ahead. That's it. As you are following Christ, someone is just one step behind you. And as long as you keep walking towards Jesus, this person will get the dust on them as well. Just stay one step ahead. So Wednesday, when you have that, that prayer time with the Lord... Thursday, you could be sharing that with somebody else. Like after you go to Bible study, you should be taking those notes and giving them to someone else. On Sunday, the people who are not here, but you know they need Jesus in their life, be like, yo, yo, look what we talked about today in church. That's making disciples. Just stay one step ahead. Don't make it complicated. Know that Jesus is with you in it. I know this is long, y'all, but I just got a few more things I want to share with y'all. Because that one step... That one step is enough for Jesus. I told y'all, disciple making is someone sharing their life with you. The man, there have been several men, uh, Russell McCutcheon, uh, Rock Hartley, Hassan Salim, giving their lives over for me. They spent time with me. They took me out to lunch, woke up early in the morning, just tearing the Bible up. The reason why I love preaching from this Bible is because this is the Bible that I was made a disciple with. I remember. I remember Soup Campbell, who discipled Hassan Salim. And Soup Campbell was discipled by by another man named Herb Hodges. Soup Campbell was told by Herb, and and, uh, Soup told Hassan, and Hassan told me, that it's all about us just being faithful and taking the first step. And I remember hearing the story where Soup Soup pointed back to uh, Luke chapter 6. And Luke chapter 6 is Jesus and his disciples. He tells them that he's going to meet them on the other side of this body of water. For some reason, he tells them to get into a boat. 
Now, if you look at that region, they could have walked it in about seven hours. But he says, get into the boat. And if you don't know the story, this is how it goes. It starts raining. Then it starts storming. And every time a storm comes, what does it bring? Fear. And yet they look out in the raging waters and they see Jesus. Now what happens after this is, is amazing. Because Peter, Peter, this, this, this guy who just, man, he's off the chain. He's like, yo, I'm about to go. <laughs> he says, Jesus, 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 if you are really who you say you are and I have belief, let me come out there with you. What blows my mind in the middle of a storm, what he wanted to do is be close to Jesus. Now, Jesus is on the water standing. Peter takes a step to go get his rabbi. If Jesus is wet, then Peter believes that he should be wet too. But the Bible says that, it says that Peter began to lose faith. But Jesus never let him sink. Now, and what happens is you, you, you think about the story and you say, well, why did, why did Peter start to lose faith? Like, why, why, ye of little faith, why did he start to lose faith? But this is what Soup Campbell told me about this story. He said, look at this picture. One man had faith and 11 men sat in a boat. See, if you fall, if you fail, after taking the first step, you know what Peter knew, that your Savior is right there with you. So as we wrap up, as we, we get to this place where we want to really embrace this value of making disciples, I encourage each and every one of you, take the first step. Take the first step. That first step is just you saying, okay, I need to be more intentional. Like Jesus, before he chose the 12, it said that he spent all night praying, and then he chose the 12. Take that first step. Pray about the people who you can lead and ask to follow you. If that first step is you committing more to what we do as a church, the regular rhythms that we have in discipleship, take that first step. If that first step is, is repenting to the Lord about your inability or your lack of desire of making disciples and your lack of being obedient to him, take the first step. Because it's better. It's better to take the step and to be wet like the rabbi than to stay in the boat. Matthew chapter 28 has a connection to Revelation. Because Jesus says, go out into the world, all nations, all ethnos, and make disciples. Because he already knows the end of the story. Revelation 7 and 9. Where it says, after John looked out, there was a great multitude of every nation, tribe, and tongue, which no person could number. Yes, God is gracious, he's loving, he's kind. God is going to transform the lives of people. But he uses each and every one of us to do it. So as we wrap up, I, I just want to point us back to verse 20. Because I truly believe that if you hold tightly to what is in verse 20, that you could be a lot more confident about obeying your Lord, remember, I am with you always. I asked Jesus so many times, why do you put that always there? The always is there because this is a all of life thing. So as you're going to and fro, remember he is with you. We wrap up all of our gatherings remembering that same fact. Because just like the commission, there's communion, where Jesus shares himself with us. And in communion, he promises his presence. 
As you walk down the aisle today, if you walk down this aisle, it's your proclamation of faith again in Jesus. But I also want to encourage you that as you walk down this aisle, that you repent of not obeying Jesus in the making of disciples if you have not been making disciples. But that you truly have faith. You truly have faith that he is with you whether you're doing it or not. Because he loves you. He's given everything for you. And he wants to show the people in the world that do not have that, that he's done the same for them. It's our custom. We start right here in the front. We walk down the aisle. We grab our our, uh, elements. We return to our seat. I'll give you a couple seconds to do some business with the Lord. And then we'll be led by scripture in the Lord's Supper. You're now welcome to come.